Um, was there anything in particular to cover, so, just kind of in general? So what or? their question was um, that was immediate concern, and they didn't do the deal, but it was that how do they protect their, how do they purchase it and get the money if the owner still own, owes, uh, still owns part of the property? And how did you do the contract so that the, um, so that when you got <clears throat> to, to this resale point, that you got the profit, not them? Gotcha. Um, so the way I structured the contract, and I have that here, hold on just a second. Okay. Um, is, uh, I mean, they came to me and they said, um, we're in foreclosure and we need to get out of, out of this situation. And they had quite a bit of equity. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and so I structured the contract that I paid off their second mortgage. Um, I paid off, I had to contact the, um, the uh, attorney that was doing the foreclosure process in, um, and they, they gave me the paperwork and you know showed me the latest statement said they owed $13,600 ish. <clears throat> they gave me their statement from Citibank and it was $7,600, that was their second. So I paid those two things off completely. And, um, and then, so my uh, contract, that what I'm reading off is how am I going to pay for this, for this house? Um, so there was paying off those two things, assuming their mortgage uh, of 131000 And um, I also told them there would be a $20,000 that I would hold back and pay to them at the end of the contract when I sold the house. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. And then um, I figured out, uh, and then we got to the, the remaining balance was $66,500. And I gave them that at closing. So I paid for all that and then uh, started making payments to the bank um, on their first mortgage that I assumed. And then, um, so at that point, uh, when I rehabbed the house and then sold it, I, I, you know, I'm not sure how to, sh how to say, uh, you know, my, I was protected to get the profit at the end of the job. Um, but they were out of the picture as far as at closing, they weren't at the closing table. I was at the closing table when I sold it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, you know, other protections I've, might have needed or could have needed but an attorney wrote this all up and we closed originally at his office we didn't close at a title company and one of the things that was kind of interesting about it is um and i remember asking you grace about this i didn't realize i had thought a wraparound mortgage and a subject two were synonymous and they're not <clears throat> and so i use the term wraparound i like to use tina nalt at cascade title and when I originally went to her to close at her office, um, she's, I, I used the term wraparound. I doing a wrap on the mortgage and that's not what it is. Um, a wraparound for those, if you haven't heard that term before is where people do what I did, except then when they rehab the house, they keep the mortgage and then just start renting out the house and continue to pay the other person's mortgage. And so it's still in their name, they still, if, if the, you know, Experian or whoever, I uh, can't think of the other credit company, runs a credit check, they still see the mortgage in that, in, um, I'm going to call him Mr. Foxglove, because it was on Foxglove Avenue, that's not his name, but anyway, Mr. Foxglove, it, it would show on his credit report that he still had the mortgage to that house, and so it would go basically against his credit if he was trying to get a, uh, another mortgage. Um, somewhere down the line. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, like I said, I had an attorney that specializes in, in real estate contracts to write this so that they were out of the picture. It was all on me 
to take care of paying his mortgage. And I gave him a monthly, you know, statement every time I paid it on the fifth, it was due on the 10th or something like that. I can't remember exactly the dates, but I was paid it about five days ahead of time, sent him an email, said, here's the, here's the payment record from, you know, I, I logged in, made an account. No, let's see. I didn't do that. I was trying to keep it under wraps, right? And I don't want the, the I don't bank. want the bank to know that, yeah, that I, I'm now paying the mortgage. And when I talked to him originally, I just said, I'm a property manager and I'm helping them fix up the house so that they can sell it because obviously they're having all these issues paying you guys and you're trying to foreclose on them. Um, and I, um, and they were fine with it. In fact, they were so, I was really worried about telling them that I was doing that and that we were in this process of, of, uh, is this who you were talking about, Grace? I, ha Tammy? I haven't looked yet. Yep, that's who. Okay. Tammy, um, welcome. I guess you were on uh, the Tony Young's webinar. No, I wasn't. I was well, taking a listing appointment late, so oh. I wasn't on either. Okay. Well, Brad Larson is telling about his experience of buying a subject to and flipping it okay. and selling it. And I am recording this, so um, you'll have it for record and you'll be able to get it at the on the website, okay? okay? But um, feel free to ask questions. But I posed your question, which was how did you, how, Brad, how did you protect yourself to get all the funds at the end when it was still in, okay, was it still in the owner's name, Mr. Foxglove's name, Brad? When you when you did it, he's the um, owner, right? Right. Did you file uh, a lien well, of any no. sort? No, uh, actually, you're right. That's why that that's how I did it. We ha I had a warranty deed that we signed at closing. Uh, okay. So the deed was in my name and recorded at the at the um, county. And this is before so, you started making payments to the bank. Right. Oh. Well, <clears throat> at closing i gave them the the 66 000 in equity and we wired um, money to the attorney to pay off the the arrears on the first mortgage and we wired money to citibank for the second mortgage and then i started making payments on it so uh, my my question is oh my gosh um, I bet you couldn't get a lender to help with the construction. Uh, no, I, I didn't. I thought about it and they were, um, I talked, I can't remember who I talked to, but uh, people were willing to chip in just, you know, it, it didn't need a lot. It was built in 2000 and, oh, I want to say eight. Um, so it wasn't an old home. It just needed some TLC, some serious TLC in some places. Um, and so they had both fallen under bad, poor health. And so the, the house just wasn't getting cleaned. It wasn't getting, they, and you know, they weren't working. They had, I mean, I don't know, the story's long, but it just needed some serious TLC, but it was one of the less expensive, um, rehabs we've done. <clears throat> I kind of use it as the lower end of a rehab cost. People ask me what it costs to rehab a house, you know, and, and per square foot is, is a good, it's a good one of these, you know, don't, don't, don't think you're going to get very close to your actual budget using a per square foot cost, but it's a good, you know, it's always good to have at least a starting point. And that one was $25 a square foot. That's basically my minimum, you know, that I would ever tell somebody it's going to take to rehab a place. $50 a square foot's pretty, pretty high, you know, kind of 30, 40, 40 is pretty typical, at least for the ones we get, because we get them in pretty poor shape. But uh, yeah, I had the warranty deed and that was, uh, that was my concern. I was talking about being concerned that the bank would know that I was now the owner of the house, but the mortgage was still in their name. And that's the key right there is getting the um, deed, getting a deed uh, put in your name and record it with the county um, so that it's, it's your property. Um, so you don't need to go to title to do that, right? You can just go down and go to the county? Um, I did a closing at my attorney's office that wrote up the contract. 
and then okay. they went and then they went and did it but uh so i was explaining that i tried going to the title company and i used the wrong word i thought a wraparound mortgage was synonymous with doing what i did which is called subject to financing um and when i said the word wraparound it just was an automatic no from everybody at the title company so we didn't end up using a title company the attorney i was using to write the contract just said well we'll just close up my office and that'll be fine and um, so, so yeah go ahead oh no go ahead sorry brad nope. no that's fine I'm, I'm all ears if you have questions well um i do have a question so i went to the title company i had a client willing to sell me their house and they owed only like $48,000 on their first mortgage, right? And um, I could have paid it off, but I didn't want to. And they agreed to wait until we fixed up the house and resold it to get their money. But I just couldn't quite rectify it with title because the um, credit union had a first on it. And so they weren't open to if I understood them right, they weren't open to language with the subject to because the bank would not allow us to have any ownership. So you're saying maybe an attorney and a warranty deed would be the answer? Yeah, <clears throat> I can give you the name of the attorney we used, or I'm sure there's other good ones out there. Um, but yeah, it worked out well to just close at his office. And, you know, it, it's it, the, the person's really taken a leap of faith to some degree to just sell, you know, Mr. Fox. I'm calling the person that sold me the house, Mr. Fox Club, because he lived, the house was on Fox Club Avenue. Right. Um, for, for Mr. Fox Club to just, you know, he had, he had actually met with another um, rehabber from Portland. And it's funny, he, I had about 233,000 in my mind, 230 something thousand in my mind. And, uh, he says, oh, some guy came from Portland and he offered me 233000 There's just no way I'm taking it for that amount of money. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, uh, now what do I do? So I, and, and we've, this has been said before in our RIA meetings and our main meetings, listening is one of the most important things you need to be able to do when you're dealing with a homeowner or anybody really. And uh, what his situation was is, Basically, they wanted to get to the end of the school year. This was in April when he first contacted me. It might have been, yeah, I think it was, I think it was like first or second week in April. And uh, they wanted to get to the end of the school year and they had, they didn't have any money. I was telling everybody earlier, Tammy, that they were in really, they had, both of them had come under poor health. And so, you know, weren't working, so they couldn't make their payments. And they were, you know, it was just kind of the downhill, uh, downward spiral. But their daughter, uh, they wanted to get to the end of the school year. They didn't have any money to move. And so they wanted to get the, you know, do something with somebody that they could get the equity out. So they had some money to get an apartment, get a U-Haul, get our storage unit and all those things and actually get moved in a, in a reasonable way. So one of the criteria was, you know, getting some money up front, uh, getting a little time to stay in the house while they packed and, and loaded stuff up onto a U-Haul and got some of their friends to come over and help them move. So after we finally, we settled on 240,000. So it wasn't very far away from where I was originally. Um, but uh, I just took his payment off of his first mortgage and second mortgage. And I just said, these are $1,600. If you add the two of them together, I'm gonna offer you $238,400. It's basically the 240 we discussed earlier minus one month's rent. So I got the month's rent kind of up front, if you will, um, so that that wasn't hanging out there and I had to rely on them to pay me. And then right. um, <clears throat> I was I was describing what I paid to, for the property. Tammy, earlier, I paid their second mortgage. I paid their um, all the arrears and all the fees that had accumulated with the attorney. Um, to get the first mortgage up to date. And then I assumed the first mortgage and gave them 66,000 in equity. And then there was 20, they had 86,000 in equity, but I kept 20 of it at the attorney's office, which actually he, uh, that's another story. He couldn't, he's, he ended up being told by his insurance company that that was a being a 
um, an escrow company and he couldn't do that anymore, an escrow account, even though it's in his trust account. And so we had to start dispersing it to the homeowner a little bit at a time. But we came up with that number. He, he, he floated 50,000 uh, as a holdback. But um, I ended up thinking that 20,000 was the right number um, in my own mind, but it was 10,000 if I had to evict him, if after the one month, he wasn't actually out of the house. 5,000 right. was a damage deposit if they did any damage to the house. And, and he and I walked through the house the day of closing or maybe the day after closing. And we took pictures of every wall and every room. And even though I couldn't see a lot of the walls behind stuff. Um, so there was a couple surprises, but not, there wasn't anything egregious. It was just, you know, anyway. Uh, so it's 5,000 for that. And then 5,000 in case there was other fees, because you just never know, even though the attorney said this will get the first mortgage current, you know, you just kind of have in the back of your mind, it's like, oh yeah, sure. I'm sure right. there's going to be some other fee, some other something they're going to dream up. So after they moved out and everything, and I'm on the rehab trail, uh, you know, hot and heavy doing that they asked if they could get 10,000 of that. And I, I wrote them a check for, or I had the attorney write them a check for 10,000. And um, cause that was the eviction amount. And I still think I held on to the, even though they hadn't damaged the place, I still held on to the 10 other 10, the five and the five. Um, then getting really close to closing, I wrote them another check for 5,000. Um, that was the damage deposit, so to speak. And then um, I, I held back I think I only held back 2,000, 10% of the 20,000 I held back to when I closed. What were so, your attorney fees? Uh, it was, I think it was close. It's, it's unfortunate. It was close to a couple grand because uh, I, we ended up writing the contract twice. Um, but now I have a really good template. Uh, I bet it would be 500 bucks to do it another time. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so when I looking have a for, go, go ahead. ahead. I just have Sorry. a question of vernacular there. You, you talked about paying back the other 2000 or something um, at closing. Is that the first closing or the second closing? Uh, the, the second closing. Okay. When you sold it. Yep. Yep. They were, they ended up on my seller's uh, uh sheet from the title company, uh, closing statement from the title company. There was a, a line item for outside of, and I can't think of what they, there's a term for it outside of closing or something like that. But yeah, they actually went down to the title company to get the, the final check. <clears throat> Maybe, I don't, I don't know. I can't you closed remember. with them at the attorney's office and then when you resold it, you closed at the Company. Yeah, I just went to my regular um, escrow yeah. officer that I use for title, for closing. So does your escrow officer let you do any assignment of contract or is that what they run away from? Uh, no, they're fine with assignments. Um, okay. It was just the uh, that word wraparound, which I was explaining to everybody earlier is when a, a true wraparound is when I would do this, what I just did. And except instead of selling the house, start renting the house and keep the mortgage in Mr. Foxglove's name, even though I have the warranty deed and I have somebody else living in the house now, uh, that's a true wraparound mortgage. And so I, I, I shouldn't use that word. I shouldn't have used that term because that's what really turned them off because they thought that's what I was going to do. Um, I should have just said, I'm assuming their mortgage. And, and not even, you know, give them as little detail as possible because truly to an assume somebody's mortgage, you got to go to the bank and qualify and, right. and, you, and your name gets put on the mortgage. But in, you know, and I, I didn't, I was willing to even put money in and use the title company as a, they have a payment center downstairs at, at Cascade Title. And if you sell property, and I'd encourage you to do it, you can use them as the payment center so that the payments come to you through them. And there's a record that somebody can go back to that's a lot right. better than just my own personal records or collection escrow. 
yeah, there you they, go. they handle it. Yeah. Yeah, my confusion still is in my own scenario how I might have gotten on title. And I guess like you said, it's I I don't I can't do it maybe through the title company, but I was hoping that I could this seller decided to go ahead and hold on to their house. It wasn't really in distress. Um, they had a family member that passed and decided they wanted to sell. And then at the end of the day, they decided they didn't. So we didn't go through with it, but we had a good trusting relationship. We had the details lined out. I just needed to find a way to protect ourselves and them and um, get it to close, you know, get it to all repaired and then flip. There are title companies that are more friendly to these kinds of scenarios. Um, I'm trying to think, Grace, of the guy that he used to be at Evergreen Title, and now he's on his own. And he came to the meeting when I did the presentation on subject two. George. Um, hmm? George. George. Yes. George. Forgot his yeah, name. Yes. Yeah, I know George. I used to work with him at First American here. Okay. Really? I will talk to George. Yeah. Yeah. So he opened up, um, I think it's called Oregon. I tried to get him to advertise line. with me, yeah. Oregon escrow or something like that. Right. Uh -huh. And and he worked at Evergreen. That's where I met him. And I was telling you about Evergreen um, because they're, they're my goatee and they're like a, I call them boutique and that might be an insult to them, but they're <laughs> but I, but they're, <laughs> but I, it shouldn't be, but I, I, I totally because, get your meaning. Yeah, they're boutique and they like love their people and they love investors, you know. So, and, and, um, and I was gonna say, Brad assigned um, a contract to me that I bought through Cascade. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to remember the details. If we did that through Cascade, I couldn't remember. Yeah, it was through your gal, Tina. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Well, I know the title manager pretty darn well. Well, I know them all, but I'm sure you guys know yours too. But um, at um, Ameritidal here, I don't know that they won't do something creative, but they're obviously they're not going to help me with the language. So, right, so, that is um, the key. And they were, like I said, they were pretty adamant that um, you know that the bank needs to give us permission to be on title, but I don't quite agree with that, so. Right. So interesting, because you know, Tammy, yesterday when I was, we were talking, I was on COVID uh, Pfizer second shot brain yesterday, and I was Perfect. sweating bullets there, <laughs> and we were talking, and I was saying rap, and then I was like, well, no, it's not a rap, it's subject to, and you know, so hours later, when I calmed down, I was like, oh my gosh, I was saying rap, and it's subject to, I know who to get Brad on tonight, so <laughs> I was like, I, I too was like confused, but I found that it's interesting that Brad was able to do a warranty deed, purchase it, pay them off already and and then just take over this the uh, payments yeah uh, so i, yeah, I didn't realized you could do that i was real worried about um recording it because then the bank could go look at the the you want sale clause yeah so the yeah reason they could go why look it works it. and i'll tell you why because it will change is because interest rates have been going down and down. So whenever they bought it, maybe 2008, interest rates were higher. And so, and now they're at an all time low and no bank wants to redo a loan at th these low rates when they're making, you know, 4% or something right. like that, or 6%. So, gotcha. so when it, when it reverses and interest rates go up, that's when we need to worry about this kind okay. of idea. They technically don't want inventory either. They're not very good at liquidating their inventory. Right. In They've learned opinion, that lesson. But, yeah. And but, I mean, to some degree, um, Tammy, I was saying earlier, it was a pretty, it was a pretty cosmetic flip. It was more of the carpet paint appliances type of flip. It was a little more than that, but not much more. Um, my attorney and I just, I mean, he just kind of sat down and said with me and said, who cares? 
if they even if they come forward with a due on sale clause, you're going to have it rehabbed in how many months? And I said, oh, probably two or three. And he goes, OK, and have it sold in, you know, another month. Right. Yeah. OK. He says, as as slow as they are, you can just keep putting them off and keep putting them off and you'll be out of there, out of the picture before they can really the before they even that's exactly what them. i thought that's exactly what i was thinking of the title company like i don't care if they if they exercise their do on sale clause it'll take them way too long to do anything about it and in this instance i could have paid it if i had right. to i just didn't want to oh that's cool i mean you know i mean it was a pretty low amount yeah this was um, 130 31 000 i inherited no 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 this was only mine was only 48 so you know it would have sucked because i needed money for repairs i actually but did a joint I'm, oh go ahead go ahead yeah i actually did a joint venture with a with a private lender because it was i think i had to come up with about one hundred and twenty thousand to pay off their equity their second and their all their years and still have some money to rehab the property and you did a joint venture with who uh just a friend that's private money lender yeah well, we were going to do private money at first on this, and I thought, well, if they'll just wait until we close this house, we're going to sell it fast, we'll fix it up fast, we'll sell it fast. If these guys can wait for their money, then I can give them a little more money because I don't have to pay it to the private money lender and everybody will be happy. Um, and then I woke up one night and went, oh, yeah, there's that first. <laughs> Somebody's got to do something about that first mortgage. Um, so anyway are you is it um i don't know oreia's protocol is it okay if i have something in the future can i reach out to you directly brad or is that not something you sure care for no I, <laughs> it's a group to what's together we're better right okay right. okay so yeah. the new motto is together we unite to build our real estate businesses <laughs> it's a little longer it what's was the <laughs> are there other people on this call i can't tell i'm in the car yes there are do other people have questions for brad or tammy i i've seen you guys take notes and stuff like that it's very interesting <laughs> Brad, I, th I thought you mentioned they had you they had reached out to you i'm curious how you found how you found this deal oh, who are you right. asking me oh. so um brad how we found this at, deal yeah at that point in time craigslist was actually a pretty decent way to say we buy houses and get good responses um it's just not that way anymore well i haven't tried it again for a year probably i think last may if i remember right was i, I got it i logged into my account and said man when was the last time i posted on on craigslist and i think it was may um, so yeah, he reached out to me, um, and I'm not sure how, if the other, uh, investor from Portland that he mentioned had, had made him an offer also, um, if he was also, uh, doing Craigslist or if he had, you know, a pre foreclosure list and had saw that this was in, you know, and contacted them then contacted this guy and he didn't like the offer that the guy from Portland gave him. So he started maybe looking around uh, here locally, but yeah, that he responded to a Craigslist ad, which is like one of the only decent responses. I've, uh, I think I actually have bought two houses through those Craigslist. Um, we pay cash for houses type ads. Good question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Getting back to the, the bank. I actually, when I, was taking over the payments and I can't remember why I was on the phone while I explained to them that I was helping. I wanted something to come to me and not to them. Or maybe I was worried, I was trying to figure out the insurance situation, which I insured it in addition to their insurance that they their, their mortgage was the PITI, you know, principal interest taxes and insurance. They were paying insurance through their house payment. I just, I just kept making the payment. I don't care. It's like, I'd rather be doubly insured and I don't want to, you know, totally tip my hand and say, you can take that insurance off now because I've got it insured. So I just paid for my own insurance as well as paying theirs. But I was on the phone with them for some reason, getting information. And, uh, 
I kind of started quizzing him about what would happen if somebody actually bought the house or something like that. And, and he was just totally clueless. Uh, when I explained the situation that I heard some, you know, my friend <laughs> talked about doing this, um, he, uh, he said, oh, that sounds like um, um, deed in lieu of foreclosure. And I said, I just went, wow, this guy doesn't have a clue what, what I'm even talking about or what's going to about to happen here as far as me taking this over as the property manager, even though I'm now on title um, and, you know, about, or about to be on title. I don't think we had closed at that point, but that was when I was pretty scared about, oh, the due on sale clause. And uh, they maybe it is just the interest rates grace but you know it just seemed like the people on the phone they they don't know they don't care they just want us to, they just want somebody to keep making the payment right hey so put in the chat um your attorney's name if you mm. don't mind yeah i don't mind you don't if you want to give him a shout out <laughs> i forgot about the chat that's great um, um Kurt i do this all day long <laughs> I, I had a question about the bank. I mean, uh, I was um, I was working on a deal that uh, I was trying to pick up uh, here in Portland, and um, the guy actually had a mortgage, and and uh, he was trying to sell the house, and uh, the whole thing of the mortgage and the bank, and once once you actually uh, <clears throat> once you start actually proceeding with that uh, with closing and everything, you have to report it to the bank. So how how did you how did you deal with that uh, with the bank in terms of that? I mean with it when you went to closing to close and you, the property went into your name did I mean did the bank ever reach out to you at all and say you know because I I heard kind of what you said earlier like if you come across like you're the property manager they basically assume that you're just managing the property and not actually purchasing the property but the property actually physically changed to your name. So then uh, that kind of changes the whole thing. So the bank can actually call out the loan. So did you get any, any, any information from the bank in that direction where they were trying to reach out to you? And, <laughs> or they were just like you said earlier, the guy's just kind of clueless on what you were doing with that transaction. No, I never, I, I never heard from the bank. The only time I ever talked to them was when I called them looking for information. And so that's what I was saying is they don't, they don't really care as long as somebody continues to make the payment. And, and I can't remember if it was Tammy or somebody else talking about, they don't like to have inventory, so they don't want to go through the process. Um, I don't know what, it, if there's fees attached to the due on sale clause in addition to just paying off the balance, but I imagine it's a whole ton of paperwork uh, <clears throat> that they, they would have to go through to, to do it just to get the balance back and if they you know they've probably seen this a few times before at least somebody in the boardroom has to know that this happens on a regular basis probably you know for yeah anyway no i never got a i never got any any uh calls from them at all I, I was listening to a podcast a while ago and there was a group of people that were really had done a lot of these and they just said it was a very rare thing for ever to be called due that the bank, as long as the bank's getting paid on time, they're good. Yeah. And just anecdotally, I helped um, someone with a probate. His mom had passed and I called the mortgage company to just put the mortgage in the son's name. Um, they did not blink an eye. I was stressed about it. I thought the same thing. Does he have to qualify? What about his credit? Does he have to refinance? They were just like, sure, you know, they didn't bat an eye, so. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that weren't here when Stephanie introduced herself, she's an attorney, an attorney that's wanting to focus into real estate. Just moved to Eugene, is that right, Eugene? From the fire zone. Yeah, my office in uh, my little law firm in Talent, Oregon burned on September 8th, so relocated here in uh, November. What's the name of your office? It was Talent Legal Pad. Um, you can still find me there, talentlegalpad.com. And now it's Virtual Legal Pad. <laughs> doing a little, little rebranding. I'm really sorry you lost your office. My um, parents lost their everything in the Phoenix fire right near there in so Talent sorry. Phoenix area. I'm so sorry. It was it was like a bomb dropped. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, terrible. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, 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 
the summary of Brad's story is, if I can like kind of summarize it and you tell me if I'm wrong. Um, first of all, when you're making an offer, listen, 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 and find out what their real needs are and then make it happen for them. What, and I know like when I bought that place on Queen Street, I gave them, I paid them $5,000 before I even closed but it had it all in the contract and a receipt and all kind of stuff. And they were happy to sign to get that 5,000 in order to um, pay moving costs and pay uh, deposit on apartment and that kind of stuff. And, um, and so that's taken out of the sale price. And, and then, and I gave, I think it was like a two month time period that we, we were working on. So when time is not always of the essence, like, because I know my advertising is we buy fast, <laughs> we, we buy houses fast, you know, but, um, but, or we buy cash. And, and so like I did that same sort of thing. And then, um, and found out that they were, because of their situation, they were willing for Brad to make the payments on the bank that was foreclosing. I'm guessing that was the bank, not the second that was foreclosing. It was the first that was foreclosing. Yeah, we paid off the second. So we assumed the first and made those payments. Yeah, and the, and the second was not foreclosing. No, they were silent. <clears throat> okay. They hadn't okay. even they hadn't even been tacking on fees or anything. They were just hoping to get their money out of it because they were in second position. Okay. And and then um, I'm guessing that the first was a large institution. Is that right? Yeah, I hadn't heard of them before, but yeah, I can't remember. I'd have to look now who it was. But, even uh, a, even a local one, if it was Washington Bank or something like that, they would have worked with you, I'm pretty sure, if it's a small one. But they would have been much more communicative. It was, it was called it was called Ditech Mortgage in South in Rapid City, South Dakota. Never heard of them either. Yeah, okay. Sorry, and, Tammy, you started to ask a question. I was just gonna say if if you had had that strange anomaly of the bank that found that paperwork and and did that do on sale like, like you said really you'd probably have been protected because you had such a short turnaround time so it is a a pretty low risk i think yeah i think it's pretty low i i can't remember if we did before so, and an after or just a before on that one brad for the oh mis uh, mystery meeting yeah yeah I think we just did a before. Yeah. I remember. I don't remember doing an after on that one for sure, but I remember doing the for before and it needed, you know, the flooring and paint and kitchen, the usual. Yeah. Right. Appliances. Yeah. And, but I remember you telling me also that there was mold later on that you discovered in a wall. Isn't that right? Yeah. I, it wasn't, it wasn't anything significant. But he had an aquarium that had gotten away from him, saltwater aquarium <laughs> that had gotten away from him. <laughs> okay. I, I have a general question related to you structure a deal and everything is all tied around that closing, like you either doing a refinancing or a sale, and then this guy gets this and this guy gets that, and every and what if on some particular deal, how do you cover yourself if someone says, Eh, I'm not going to sell. I mean, uh, what do you write into the agreement? Like, okay, then as of such and such date, the rehab will be done. As of such and such date, this property will be sold or? Um, so we closed in May. I mean, like I said, he contacted me in April and uh, we closed May, I want to say 17th or something like that. And, and that's when I, that's when we signed the warranty deed and it was recorded right after that. So I gave them their equity that was left uh, after I assumed the mortgage and paid off the other stuff uh, out of the 240,000 I offered him. And, uh, and so it was my property at that point. So there yeah, was no, well, Mike, that was you know, exactly, if he backed out before. Mike, that was exactly Tammy's question. Yes, yeah. that was exactly Tammy's question yesterday she posed to me and, and how to protect yourself in the end. So in, in the, uh, the answer is, is to buy it up front and assume the mortgage. And then you get to where well, we have it. Let me get specific. 
Let, let me get specific with a general question. Um, uh, I, I might be uh, doing private money to somebody 25K. Um, they are, uh, this is a beautiful North Eugene home and he's just uh, doing stylish updates and, and adding a fourth bedroom uh, with the intention to refi. Um, after refi, it'll be well over 600K. Um, I, I would be behind the mortgage and then also a 50K private lender. And then, so I'd be in third position and everything's to be dependent on that he gets this done and refis. And well, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, that's his whole point and, and he's got a beautiful place and he could even sell it to summer or something. But, um, you know, I, the, uh, the agreement can't be written to say, you know, oh, well, you know, I, I will be paid upon refi because if he said, oh, I'm not gonna refi, I don't get paid. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how I structure that tail end part. Good question. <laughs> so because, I, I because I've done Sorry. lending to rehabbers, um, my concern is that they might be spending more than the profit um, is going to be. In other words, the they're paying the first, they're paying the second, and they're supposed to pay you. But in, in both situations, they sold for underneath the amount that would pay for my loan. So, and so and I was you, screwed. You go after them? What do you do? Yeah, I go after them and, and I've been lenient on one, way too lenient on the other. They've been awesome. And, and, and I rewrote the, the loan and they're paying monthly. Oh. Yeah, and then I put a lien on their their own house. On both of them, I put a lien on their residence instead. Yeah, and I'm second. so Brad, Brad. If if I remember your you know, your story with uh, with the purchase, uh, you didn't close uh, you didn't close normally with that uh, with the with the mortgage company. You actually closed with that uh, with that uh, with with the lawyer at the end of it, right? So you actually signed papers. So you. So did you pull title on all the on, the, on any of the stuff? I mean, they had it. You, so you knew there were basically three payments that needed to be made, right? They they had the third. Uh, I think you said twenty thousand, and then the second mortgage, and then they have the then the actual mortgage. So it was a three payments that were actually combined together, right? On your purchase. So yeah, I did a I did a Cascade Title did an expediting for me, and I got a title report, preliminary title report, title report, um, and uh, no, the twenty thousand was what um, was money I kept out of their equity as a deposit, so to speak, um, in case back. they didn't move out. It's called a hold What's back. That? A hold back. Yeah, I did a twenty thousand dollar hold back so that um, because I gave him one month's rent after I got the title, um, after I got the yeah uh, deed, um, I wanted to make sure ten thousand was an eviction a dollar amount I put to what it would cost to a victim, and five thousand was a damage deposit, so to speak, and five thousand was a just in case the bank or the attorney or the second mortgage ever came up with any additional fees. Um, so that twenty thousand. So yeah, I got the title. I got the title report, and um, only those two. Um, lenders showed up, Citibank and Ditech Financial. And uh, so I felt good about everything. They said, you know, here's all my records, but I went and got the title report right away. And they were, they gave it to me like the next day, which was awesome. Um, and so, uh, sorry, what was the other part of that question as far as what I was paying for? Oh, no, I was just interested in the, the three pieces because there were three uh, three sums that were together. Now there was a twenty thousand. I think there was like the seventy thousand uh, uh, that he had out on the, as a, as, and then there was the mortgage. So right. I was just really curious in terms of how the you know how the whole thing got structured because I mean in general when I you know when I was trying to do my deal I was talking to that uh, uh, when I was trying to do the the paperwork side of it uh, uh, the more uh, the what is it um. um the underwriter, they said that you, we have to we have to pay the bank to actually in order for us to actually 
close to paperwork. And then it sounds like you didn't have to do that. So somewhere oh. along the line, you structure your, your deal worth. I mean, you kept that, uh, you kept the mortgage with the bank and you just kept making the payments. And I was trying to do the same thing, but for some reason, maybe I, I didn't ask the right question. So maybe I just didn't know how to structure the deal out, but uh, that, that's where, that's where my disconnect was. So okay. for Stephanie, because you're the lawyers, you might be able to kind of help us out with this and your, in your contract also, I would love to see how the contract was written because I mean, I'd love to actually see if maybe, you know, how we, how I can actually learn from that, uh, how that that lawyer was able to actually put the contract together where you actually assume the contract. And, and I heard of the wraparounds, but I, I've never, you know, as we said, you know, we kind of continue to learn how to structure the deal. And uh, that's actually, you just said a very unique situation how you managed to, to pull that up because I tried the same thing. It didn't, it didn't work for me, but I think it was because I just, uh, you, we run into people that, that don't know what they're doing and they don't know how to deal with you. So you come across that, okay, so this is what I wanna do, but they don't know how to do the paperwork side of it so you can actually get that, but you managed to actually pull it off. Yeah, and and so there was two closings. There was the closing when I got the deed from Mr. Foxglove and I took possession of the house. And then there was the closing when I sold it. The, the, the closing when I took possession of the house, we did at my attorney's office um, because we, because I wasn't, because Cascade Title wasn't interested in doing it because I used that wrong word, um, wraparound. But that's also the discussion we were having about finding um, title companies that are, are investor friendly or um, what was that, Boutique? Is that the, Grace, the, the term you used for, for Mr. Forever Bosch? Green. Oh no, for Evergreen. Yeah. My, mine is Dana there, who's the owner, one of the owners, yeah. And so it's it's finding um, George Bosch or whoever Grace uses um, that will, like you said, you got to find the right person that understands the language and knows the end end game of what you're doing and that you're actually helping this person. I mean, <clears throat> that guy, Mr. Foxglove, I remember signing the contract uh, that I had written up with some advice from the attorney and and he had helped me with it. And then, then we ended up re rewriting the whole thing. But the first contract I signed with him, he thanked us a couple of times. You know, I took my wife, I always take my wife with me when I'm doing deals with people, especially in that situation. But uh, um, it, yeah, to hear him thank us for helping them because they knew that the, they could finally see the end in sight. They knew they were going to get the 60,000 and 66,000 in equity and they were going to actually be able to start looking for an apartment, start kind of start fresh, you know, hit the reset button. Um, but uh, yeah, finding finding the right team is definitely key to the whole thing. So, so you actually kind of point out to a good uh, a, a good key point right there. So you used the word wrapped around, and that was uh, the title company didn't like that. So right. what, or what term would would you use? Uh, would they even the lawyer? What what do they recommend to use when you actually assume in the mortgage from you know from somebody else? Yeah, the, the, the real estate investor's term is, is subject to, I'm buying it subject to me being satisfied. I've got all their financing figured out and I'm willing to assume it. I would just tell them a, a title company or somebody that I'm going to assume the loan um, in a, I'm not sure what word I'm looking for here, but assume their loan, but I'm not going to go through the formal a um, process of assuming their loan and put my name on the mortgage. They're still going to own the mortgage, but I'm going to own the house just long enough. And it's a temporary thing. Tell them that over and over again, this is a temporary situation, just long enough for me to rehab the house and sell it. So everybody can get their piece of the pie back and we can pay off their first mortgage eventually. Is that clear enough yeah, or? I, I, th I think so 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 at the end of the day basically what you become is because they had the three other loans out on the property you become basically the, the third lien holder the fourth lien holder on the property then um no yeah no not really i mean yeah. i didn't i didn't because i paid off the second the first was the only one that was left and and i would okay. and Okay. It's kind of a three-way thing. It was the first mortgage, the owner that's on the first mortgage, and me as the owner of the house. Got you. okay, okay. I I now I understand your deal. And okay, I see how that worked out. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you for explaining that. I mean, that's actually yeah. very, uh, that, that's, that's pretty, pretty good because I mean, I think a lot of it's just, you know, a matter of how you, um, it's not how you manipulate it, but how you present the deal. I think that's what I end up working out at the end. So thank you for sharing. That's actually very informative. No problem. And I put my cell phone up there. Any of you are welcome to, um, I put it there for Tammy, but uh, any of you are there welcome to give me a call anytime. No, only I get it. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, we can see it. We can all see it. <laughs> yeah, for the chat. Does so, anybody else have any questions? Brad, you, oh, go ahead, Tay. Sorry. So, Brad, I have never um, written anything with subject to language. You mentioned it. So, in a normal scenario, you're just writing it. Basically, this contract is subject to some sort of due diligence, basically. That's basically, yeah, very good. That's a good par paraphrase of it. Um, it's just my contract says sale of property. I'll, I'll try and redact this so I can get their names out of it and just leave all the information here. Um, and it just spells out, uh, we have a contract. Uh, the seller owns real property and is going to sell it to the buyer. It has two existing mortgages, a primary through Ditech and a secondary through uh, second mortgage through City, and that the seller agrees to, to sell the property to the buyer. And then the buyer is, here's how he's gonna pay for the, here's the, here's the payment, here's the uh, price, sell, sale, sell price, sale price, goodness sakes. And payment is, and I had given him $1,000 uh, earnest money, and it was with the attorney paying off the second, paying off the attorney with for foreclosure, assuming the first mortgage, holding back $20,000 and giving them 66,000, which was the remaining balance of the sale price, which is their equity. So I'll, I'll try and get most of this into a- That's pretty good. PDF that people, people can That'd be look great. at. And I'm, I'm putting together a library of real estate contract templates and I'm sure everybody has their own but um, I'd love to see that one too and happy to share any templates I get my hands on too. Okay. I'm an attorney. You want to share your information Stephanie <laughs> just in case we need you? <laughs> uh, I put my info just... in the chat um, and full disclosure I do estate planning and contracts and business formation Okay. I've done a little bit of real estate, but I'm not a specialist yet. I am getting my license as an agent just to kind of take a deep dive and taking some master classes. And I do want to specialize in real estate, but um, not there yet. So yeah, but it's it's about contracts as much as anything. So I'm a contract geek. I've been a, I've been a lawyer for 25 <laughs> years or so in uh, in California and Oregon, and I I love contracts. You just awesome. want more initials behind your name. Yeah. <laughs> <I do. laughs> Pretty much. You became an attorney when you were 10 years old? I know, right? Don't look too close. Don't look too close. Now I'm 52. Wow. You're beautiful. Okay. Well, this is, like I said, it's recorded. And if anybody wants to visit back to catch it again, because it, had a lot of information, a lot of stuff there. Um, Brad did put in the chat, the attorney's name is Kirk Strowman and um, Kirk Strowman will ne no longer do escrow, uh, uh, what is it called when they're holding money? Escrow, oh, right? holdbacks, yeah. Escrow, they, right? He won't use his, uh, he can't use his- uh, Trust account. Yeah. Yeah. His client trust account can really only be used for legal services, not for, is that what they said? Yeah, um, their, uh, their insurance company came and did an audit of what all their business transactions are and to reduce their risk for his insurance, they said no more. Yeah, uh, he didn't, I can't remember exactly Escort what word trust they- accounts, yeah. It's a client trust account, yeah. yeah. But Stephanie, so what if you <laughs> what if you worked with an attorney and the title company simultaneously because they seem to really take if you have something written by an attorney they seem to be fine with it 
So you'd have right. your attorney and then you'd have them handle the escrow hold back. Right. And that's, you know, that's a very good point. That's what, uh, that's what Tina says very often. We just, we just follow the instructions. It's the instructions that need to be written well. Um, so you may be onto something there. And, and, and again, if I hadn't used the word wrap, and of course, this was only my second deal with them as well. Uh, my second acquisition. And so through them, uh, I had, it was like my third or I don't, I can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm really sure it was my second transaction with them. So I was still kind of a new, you know, face to them. And now that I've done multiple deals with them, um, I, I'm pretty sure I would be able to say, well, what is it? You know, what can I do to, to help alleviate your fears or leave, you know, make the risk the right level for you guys? Um, so I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. Tina, I think that's awesome, and she's interested in it. So yeah, you would be able to. I agree. I think that's what I'm going to do. I have a, well, I think I have a good relationship with the title companies because I'm a realtor and give yeah. them a lot of business. So I think I would just, in the beginning at least, use a combination or any good kind of templates that anybody procures and use that language. Yeah, good plan. Well, I think we're going over time here. What time yeah. is it? Yeah, 8, 19. And Brad probably got up way earlier than I did. So thank you, Brad. Thank you very much. Not a problem. Yay. Um, so tune back next month for Deal Deep Dive and see what we learn then. Until then, the main meeting is on Tuesday night coming up, which is going to be Note School, talking about gold and notes and, and how to make money during COVID shutdowns kind of thing. So well, that'll be interesting. They are coming to us from Texas and all around the United States, actually. And we'll, because of Zoom, making that possible, it's awesome that we can bring in these high-level educators and speakers. So please tune in on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Thank you, everyone, and 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 thank you for our new people joining us, Dennis, Stephanie, and Tammy, and and for those who are rejoining us, Shalene. Oh, and Vonda's new too. Sorry, <laughs> Shalene and Gail, Carol, and Mike and Brad. Thank you so much for presenting our deal deep dive tonight. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you later. See you next time. <laughs>